Let's go ahead and get started with our program. Uh, Dr. Eric Johnson is the Director of Conservation Science for Audubon Delta. And Audubon Delta is a regional office of the National Audubon Society, which covers Louisiana and Arkansas and Mississippi. And so I'd like to now turn the microphone over to you, Eric. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us tonight about black rails. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invite. Anytime I have a chance to talk about the most elusive bird in North America, it's a real pleasure. Um, Louisiana is lucky in so many ways, and the discovery of black rail in the state is just one more reason to appreciate the, the joy and beauty of birding in Louisiana. So, yeah, so I, I titled my talk, uh, Searching for Black Rails in Louisiana, a Race Against Extinction. Um, like I mentioned, this is, this is an extremely secretive bird, a sought after bird. If you're a bird watcher, they're incredibly hard to find. And it turns out they're also incredibly rare. So um, going way back to the early days of ornithology in Louisiana, even George Lowry um, hadn't, didn't really have a handle on, on black rail in the state. Um, he had done some work uh, locating yellow rails with some success uh, in his early days at LSU. Um, but uh, take a quote from his first edition of the Louisiana Birds Book, I hate to proclaim that any kind of rail is rare in Louisiana. Uh, he's indicating just how hard they are to find. We don't call them secretive marsh birds for nothing. There are, however, only four dated records for black rail in the state. These are on dates from November 9 to April 1. So essentially a few winter records um, that he was aware of um, in the state of Louisiana. But of course, almost everybody you talk to will say they have seen a black rail. Um, and you know, it's hard to separate myth from reality, um, expectations versus you know what's real. So there are lots of anecdotal unsubstantiated records of the bird in the state. And there's also the potential confusion for things that aren't black rail. Um, I get people uh, sometimes who, you know, flush a Sora um, and describe a small dark rail and um, they just don't realize necessarily how small a black rail is. It's almost literally the size of a house sparrow. Um, and of course this chick common gallinule is uh, sometimes easily confused for black rails as well because um, of their small size and their dark body. And of course, if you get a good look, you see the bald head and red bill and no way that's a black rail, but a little black fuzzball running through the grass can, can quickly catch your attention. Um, and once upon a time, you know, I've been birding in Louisiana for almost 20 years. I was trudging out to Broussard Beach to, to have some, you know, some birding fun and lo and behold, I hear a kiki dir of a black rail calling from the marshes. And um, a lot of folks who have been around the Louisiana birding scene may remember this because of the pink tricycle that was the landmark, this old washed up pink tricycle uh, that kind of marked the location of where you could potentially hear that black rail calling from. And um, yeah, I think, you know, other people got on that bird. It was around for a few weeks. And um, yeah, this was back in 2013. So you know, long before we kind of had a good sense of what was going on with black rail. And even up until about 2017, the Louisiana Ornithological Society had only hey, 13 Eric, we're accepted. We're seeing your first slide. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, then I'll go in together. Aha. Well, here's the one that quite, that, you know, doesn't quite look like a black rail that is. Thank you so much for letting me know. Here's the pink tricycle. <laughs> and yeah, so as of as of 2017, the Louisiana Ornithological Society only had 13 well-documented accepted records in the state. Um, you can see they're kind of a, a pulse of records in the spring, potentially coinciding with spring migration, um, or maybe the onset of singing with overwintering birds. Um, and then a few fall records and one lonely record in the middle of summer, which was actually a roadkill uh, found near Gaydom, Louisiana, near uh, the White Lake Conservation Area, um, which piqued a lot of people's interest. This was about, I think that was in 20, um, that was in 20, 2008. 
or 2010, something like that. Um, and in, and Brian Watts did a, a large review of the status of black rail across the continent in 2016 and basically said Louisiana is not currently known to support a breeding population. So this is this is what we knew about black rail in the state about five years ago. Very secretive, very rare, hard to find. Um, and there had been a lot of work after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill to uh, conduct marsh bird surveys, in part because of an ERTA assessment that the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries was conducting. So essentially trying to evaluate the damage of the oil spill to marsh birds um, and better understand their density and distribution. And Audubon, Louisiana, um, my office at the time, we were called Audubon, Louisiana. We conducted surveys between 2010 and 2016 at a rainy, rainy sanctuary in Southeast Vermilion Parish. And across all of those 272 sites where there were marsh birds surveyed, only one black rail was detected involving, you know, thousands of man hours and who knows how much boat gas to get to these places. Um, so yeah, so just not really out there. Um, and, you know, so this is an extremely small bird, very hard to find. Um, 30 to 45 grams, which is sort of a very plump white-throated sparrow or house sparrow. Um, but it does have distinct vocalizations. Uh, the kiki dur is very distinct. Um, but sometimes you could hear a black rail or a red-winged blackbird calling in the wind and you hear a key and it sort of sounds like the beginning of a kiki dur. Um, and rails have a variety of calls, uh, in, including black rail. They have these growls and, and various kinds of vocalizations that are much less known, um, but can also be a good way of finding them. We think they're pretty much omnivores, so eating a combination of invertebrates and seeds. Um, and they were added to the endangered species list in November of 2020. It's our newest bird addition to the ESA. And I'll, I'll talk more about that towards the end of the presentation. So thinking back on 2017 here, right, there was really good work going on in Clay Green's lab in, uh, in the uh, coastal Texas. Uh, he had two graduate students, uh, James Tolliver and Amanda Haverland. Um, who were conducting really one of the, the first really standardized thorough surveys of black rail in the state of Texas. Um, it had been known for some time that there were black rail populations at many of the wildlife refuges uh, along the coast, but they were still kind of enigmatic and people didn't really have a good sense of what they needed, what kind of habitat requirements they had. And so, um, yeah, James Tolliver and Amanda Haverland did a, did a great job kind of pulling together some of that basic ecology and they worked across this landscape. I actually got to go over and visit them um, around 2017 to see the work they were doing and get a sense for the black rail habitat. And um, I was like, oh, that's what black rails need. And I immediately had a search image of, um, of what we call now high marsh habitat. And I was thinking that, yeah, that kind of looks like the spot where I found that black rail at Broussard, Bre at Broussard Beach by the pink tricycle. Eric, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, are oh, we geez. stuck on the same uh, screen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry, guys. Let me adjust something here real quick. Bear with me. And maybe let's go back to see that slide with the rail. Here's the slide with the rail. I think this will work better now. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you can get a sense of, of what it looks like when you see one well, which is. I'm back. I gotta reshare. All right, are we are we back? Are we online? Yes. And I didn't know about the growl. What does that sound like? 
Um, to me, it sounds like a, a a little toy engine that you would kind of wind up. Um, they also do a POW uh, call, and they often will give that almost immediately in response to playback, but they'll do it once. Um, and our, our colleague in South Carolina, Christy Hand, um, sort of once she was describing what you know describing it to some folks and she's her her visual is like pow like they're like a little superhero that's that's you know waving their fist through the air um yeah so and they have a couple of other like um kiki 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 type calls that are sort of like kikis but um without the dir so yeah they have a you know variety of vocalizations that most people, you know, aren't even aware of um, for good reason. <laughs> um, yeah, so these were the sites in Texas where uh, James uh, Tolliver and Amanda Haverland were, were working um, at several of these refuges across the, the central and upper Texas coast. And you can see a group of us standing in this high marsh, really grassy uh, habitat. And I'll talk a little bit more about high marsh too here in a little bit. So, um, so yeah, at the time in 2017, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was going through the process of um, their speedy species as, uh, status assessment in preparation for um, listing the eastern black rail as an endangered species. And so funding became available to the state of Louisiana to conduct um, very specific uh, black rail searches for black rail uh, in Louisiana to figure out if there really was a distribution gap or if they had gone sort of under surveyed and underappreciated. So the service provided funding to LDWF in 2016. Um, if some of you folks may remember Dan O'Malley uh, with LDWF, he was a grad student formerly at, um, uh, at uh, Nick, um, Nichols, right? In Thibodeau, Nichols. Yeah. Anyway, so he he was a biologist for the state. He was pretty instrumental in helping secure that funding. And then almost soon after they got it, he got a job in, in Florida, left Louisiana um, to the chagrin of a lot of us who really enjoyed um, spending time with him. Um, yeah, so the state was kind of under under staff. They were in a hiring freeze and they Michael Seymour reached out to me and he was like, hey, Eric, you want to, you know, do a black rail survey? And I said, absolutely not. I have no, you know, no interest in spending a lot of time looking for nothing. Um, but then again, went to Texas, kind of saw what they were, where what they were serving black rails in over there, remembered the pink tricycle, and set up an agreement with LDWF to begin surveys in 2017 in Louisiana. And so those surveys were designed to address um our gaps in knowledge, right, which are pretty basic still. What is the population status in Louisiana? Are they only migratory through the area? Uh, what kind of habitat do they require? Um, and although this fourth bullet wasn't really a goal of the project, it's something that, you know, lingers in the back of the mind of a lot of conservation biologists. How do you create or manage habitat that this species depends on? Um, we also decided to add some yellow rail work into this uh, um, into this project uh, because they were using some of the same habitats. And again, we sort of focused on what we're calling high marsh. Um, and this turned out to be fairly successful. We got some really nice uh, media attention at the time around this work. Chris, Tristan Bauer with the Times Picayune did a great story in collaboration with Audubon Magazine and the Times Picayune. And he titled his piece, The Secret Lives of Black Rails and the Scientists Who Seek Them. So he and a photographer actually came out with us one night while we were searching for black rails in the dark. And I actually prefer an alternative title, um, The Secret Lives of Scientists and the Black Rails Who Seek Them, because you don't get to decide when you find a black rail, they, they find you. Um, and so the basic methodology of this was one to go out and utilize what ornithologists call point counts. You basically stand at a site at a predetermined location and you visit that site over and over again. Um, and so we had 33 different places on the landscape where we placed three to five of these point counts 
25 of those sites were on private land. So we worked a lot with landowners to secure access and permissions. We also added eight sites on public lands like this uh, Rockefeller and National Wildlife Refuges. So we conducted three surveys per season at each one of those points. And we did those surveys at dawn and dusk. Um, and you sit, stand there and listen for 10 minutes. And we actually added some playback to try to get a black rail if it were present to become more likely to be detected. And so we used a combination of silence and black rail calls. Um, at the time, other black rail researchers were using this kind of approach that also included a clapper rail uh, call sequence as part of this. We also did vegetation surveys and these surveys ran for about two years. Um, again, focused in the, in the middle of the winter and the, in the early spring, summer. So, what that resulted in was a total of 1,239 surveys um, and across 152 different point locations and 21 of those we determined to be occupied by black rails. They were there. 11 out of the 33 sites that we surveyed for black rails also um, were determined to, to, be, to be occupied. Um, one of the nice things about this kind of approach is you can actually estimate through Mathemagic uh, the probability of detecting a black rail given its presence, and we call that detection probability. So given a black rail is present, um, the probability of detecting a black rail over that 10 minute survey was 25% in the spring. So only one out of four visits, uh, you would actually find a black rail if it was present. In the winter, that detection probability dropped to 6%. Um, we spent a lot of time just listening to red-winged blackbirds and crickets, uh, especially in the winter um, at these sites. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like, this open, grassy, um, semi-wet, semi-dry marsh. And uh, this is essentially where we did the surveys across the state, and the green dots represent where we found black rails. So very much concentrated in southwestern Louisiana. Uh, for those of you who know the Southwest Louisiana geography, um, if you can see my mouse, this is Lake Calcasieu and Calcasieu Pass. So on either side of Calcasieu Pass was a really important spot. Broussard Beach is over there, um, Sabine Pass, and then also over here near um, Freshwater Bayou Pass. Um, so there's a there's a a pattern that's starting to emerge. One is that these passes may actually be really important geologically uh, for the habitat that supports black rails. And then I mentioned too, really quickly, that we conducted a bunch of vegetation surveys. And I'm not going to get into the specifics, but basically what we found is that the likelihood of occupancy that, that a black rail was present was very strongly um, and best predicted by the percent cover of a plant that we call Gulf cordgrass or Spartina spartani. Um, so once you get over about 50% cover, um, you have a greater than 50% chance of having a black rail present. Um, so that turns out to be a really important predictor of, of black rail habitat. And it turns out James Tolliver over in Texas independently found the very same thing, that Gulf cordgrass was a very strong predictor of black rail occupancy in Texas. So that's kind of cool. So now we have a sense of, of what these birds need. Um, and there was a second approach to, to looking for black rails too. So we weren't sure if we would actually find them doing point counts. So we set up this other methodology that we only did in the winter, what we're calling drag line surveys. And this is the hard stuff. This is where you go out at night with a team of four to eight people dragging a rope with noisemakers attached, and you trudge through the grasses in the dark with spotlights trying to kick up um, rails. Our plots were about 10 acres in size, four hectares. We had 16 of them that we surveyed over the two winters. 15 of those were on private land, one was on public land. Uh, we primarily did this in the winter. We did not want to accidentally trample um, a black rail nest if, if one was out there. Um, and then we also added radio telemetry to some birds that we captured to, to learn more about their local movements. And so we did this over two winters and seven of these 16 plots were occupied with black rails. 
So we captured seven birds in the first winter and captured 18 birds in the second winter with a few recaptures. And most of these plots were also occupied with, with yellow rails. So we did a lot of banding with yellow rails too. Um, we collected feather samples, uh, blood samples, fecal samples um, to inform different aspects of the study, uh, different, different studies. Um, there was actually a researcher who used the blood samples to try to call uh, um, for environmental DNA assessments. So she was creating a library of the genetics of, of different rail species and then trying to go out into those wetlands sampling water and soil and trying to find the genetic signature of these birds in that habitat. Um, and that was a, a nice little paper that came out of that, that study, her study. Um, so yeah, so, you know, again, proof of concept, these birds are here. Some recapturing suggests that they're, you know, not just moving through, that they're actually staying in some of these places over the winter. And then with the home range work, the, the VHF work, uh, we only did this in our second winter. Um, and what we would do is basically this transmitter would be attached to the back of a bird. It would transmit a signal that you could pick up with a handheld receiver, and then you could triangulate the position of that bird. So we did that kind of repeatedly for each of 13 different birds. And, and each one of these little polygons is the um, estimation of their home range use. So you can see fairly small areas. The home range was about 0.71 hectares, which is about like 1.2 acres. Um, and that's all they used uh, over, the, over the seven weeks for as long as these batteries would last. Um, and you can see that these home ranges overlapped too. They weren't necessarily excluding each other, at least in the winter. So, so yeah, so we published all that in a paper that just came out a couple months ago in Waterbirds, summarizing really this first effort to, to understand the status of, of Black Rail in Louisiana. So we were able to answer some of our, our gaps in knowledge that we set out to answer, like what the population status is in Louisiana. They're very local and very rare, but they are present year round. They're not just migratory through the area. Uh, we suspect that they are breeding in the state. Um, we have evidence uh, to confirm that they're overwintering through the state and that they prefer habitat dominated by Spartina, Spartany, or Gulf cord grass. So it still leaves us with this question, how do we manage habitat dominated by Spartina, Spartany, or take habitat that could be dominated by that and bring it back? The one question that we have is um, cattle. Uh, grazing. There's a lot of cattle ranching in southwest Louisiana, um, and I'll get kind of back to that in a second, but can you can you keep this habitat in a, in a herbaceous state, in a grassy state, by periodically rotating cattle on and off that habitat? Um, you don't want to overgraze because it will make it too open, too thin. Um, undergrazing, you might get shrub encroachment, tree encroachment, woody encroachment. You need to keep it in this grassy state. And cattle are certainly used for that in, in other kinds of systems like um, longleaf pine savannas and, and prairies and whatnot. And have, have been very successful tools in managing habitat. Overgrazing is certainly a problem, however, and probably has led to the demise of black rail in southwestern Louisiana to a degree. Marsh restoration. Obviously, coastal Louisiana is in a land loss crisis. You know, we've lost the area over the last 80, year, over 80 years, equivalent to the size of the state of Delaware, of land converting to open water. And so the state um, is investing in tremendous resources into restoring this habitat. So far, nobody has successfully demonstrated the recreation or restoration of high marsh. So I said I was going to talk a little bit more about high marsh, and this is this is my chance, I guess. Um, high marsh is a system that is periodically inundated by storm surge, but not the daily tidal regime. It is periodically wet. Um, when it gets rain, it runs off and, and dries. Um, but it isn't wet every day or even every week. Uh, and so, you know, I like to think of black rails not liking to get their feet wet. And um, if it's too wet, 
you don't get black girls anymore. If it's too dry, you get woody vegetation. So it's this sort of Goldilocks sweet spot. So can we create through dredging marsh elevations that mimic the proper uh, tidal regime um, to create high marsh habitat? Um, NRCS is working through a Quipper project right now, uh, which is a funding source for restoration to see if we can add some black rail high marsh habitat into that project design. Um, so there's some, some really exciting things coming out of it. That's one of the benefits of having a bird like this listed on the Endangered Species Act. It gets a lot more attention for creative ideas like that. So it's something that, um, that our office is certainly pursuing in collaboration with, with state and federal agencies. Um, most urgently, the thing that we're working on is understanding the effects of fire management on sustaining this habitat. Um, we're part of a collaborative uh, funded through the Restore NOAA Restore Science Program. This is Deepwater Horizon oil spill penalty dollars. Um, that is funding a five-year collaborative grant across the Gulf, um, based on black rail, yellow rail, and model duck, all species that are conservation priorities that utilize high marsh habitat. And so the, the premise of this study is to understand the fire interval and fire intensity on the habitat characteristics that these three species would use. And are there trade-offs in how you would apply that fire, how frequently, what time of year, those kinds of things um, in managing one species over another, or do they all sort of co-benefit from the same management techniques? So those are the kinds of questions we're working to pursue. This is a massive project. Um, it involves 19 co-PIs, uh, which are primary investigators five universities, four state or federal agencies, and two non-governmental organizations. So Audubon and Ducks Unlimited are, are those two. Um, Dr. Ariel Fournier and Dr. Mark Woodry are the, are the leads. And you can kind of see all the different, you know, a handful of the different organizations that are involved in this. So it's a pretty exciting opportunity to think big scale um, for the conservation of these, of these conservation party species. That said, We've had a lot of challenges these last couple of years, as I'm sure people can relate to. Um, so we actually submitted the funding of this grant in November of 2018. Our, our two-year study funded through LDWF ended in, in May of 2019. So we were hoping that this study would just sort of dovetail right on to the end of the other one. And you know we would just move forward full steam ahead. Got the funding in September of 2019. So not that much of a gap. Everything was looking great. Um, however, we couldn't actually use the funding because NEPA had to determine consistency of the project with whatever federal standards they had to um, check boxes they had to check. So we got delayed by six months there. All right. All right. No big deal. February 2020. What happened in March 2020? The freaking pandemic. Right, everything shut down. We canceled our field season, our first field season. And we actually hired a seasonal biologist and brought her down. She had been here for one week and then the pandemic shut everything down. So um, fortunately the funder was really grateful, allowed us to continue paying those staff as we worked through other things that they could do from, desk, from the desktop. All right, next, um, Hurricane Laura hit in August, 2020, right? Right through Southwestern Louisiana, right through Calcasieu Pass, and then followed by Hurricane Delta in October, 2020. Um, unprecedented coupling of storms. And then in November of 2020, the, the black rail was listed on the ES, onto the Endangered Species Act. So what did that do? That created permit hurdles. So we did a pilot season in April of 2021 with some point counts. Uh, we got some work done. And we finally received our Endangered Species Act permit in August of 2021, which meant we could go out and begin our first full field season in November of 2021. So almost two years after the project was initially funded. Um, and pretty much here we are, right? We finished our first winter season and we're finding hurricane impacts. We only caught four black rails this entire winter, 
And remember in uh, the winter of 2018 to 2019, we caught 18 different birds. So a less than a quarter of what we would have expected to catch this winter. So we think the two hurricanes had severe impacts on the black tail population in Louisiana. Um, so going back to the Endangered Species Act, um, the way this came about, the Center for Biological Diversity, which, which is a nonprofit, petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife in 2010 to list the endangered, uh, to e the eastern black rail, along with something like 300 other species. It was a massive list. So the service was, you know, basically tasked through court orders to, to move forward with those assessments. They released their species status assessment in 2017, which basically uh, showed through extensive modeling work that the probability of extinction for Eastern black rails um, can happen by 2068 without action. So we have maybe a 50 year window here to get um, to recover the black rail population. And its primary threat is climate change. Um, development and urban expansion is also a threat, but um, about the climate change impact a little bit. This is what the species status assessment showed. They estimated somewhere between 900 and 2,700 birds across the Gulf and Atlantic states. There's an unknown number more in the interior part of the U.S. Um, so to put that in perspective, how many birds that is, when the piping plover was listed for the Endangered Species Act in 1986, there were about 4,000 birds. So there were fewer black rails left in the United States probably than there, there were piping plovers at the time of their listing incredibly scarce. What's scary is where black rails had been surveyed well over the last uh, 30 years or so in the Chesapeake Bay region through a different kind of long-term standardized survey protocol, there was almost a 90% decline. And that habitat hasn't changed. It hasn't been paved over. It hasn't been converted to agriculture. It is probably sea level rise specifically. Um, that has removed black rails from that landscape. Again, this high marsh, if you flood it too frequently, it's no longer high marsh. If it gets a daily flooded you know, inundation, is black rails start getting their feet wet too much. Um, whether this is an impact on nesting success or survivorship or predation as they're moving up and down slope to avoid the water, we don't know but it does seem to have a direct tie into sea level rise and climate change. So that's not a great sign. Um, the Gulf Coast is still the stronghold for black rails and particularly in Texas. Texas has uh, the vast majority of these. So again, you know, as we think about how to move forward with the conservation of, of black rails and other high marsh specialists. Um, this is a scene that is, is hard to, um, to figure out uh, how to manage, right? You have uh, cattle grazing up against the beach in these high marsh systems. Um, and, and in Louisiana, this is all on private land. Um, there aren't federal uh, programs yet that have been established to incentivize um, private landowners to, uh, uh, to implement conservation plans for, for black rails, um, like there are for things like red cockaded woodpecker and other endangered species. It doesn't exist yet. It's something we're, we're still working through. And then to add insult to injury, this is where each one of you on the call can play a role in the conservation of black rails. Um, southwestern Louisiana is about to experience a, a liquefied natural gas export boom. Um, there are already three existing LNG facilities in southwest Louisiana with many more on the horizon. This one in particular is particularly problematic because it is literally on the most important known black rail habitat in the state of Louisiana. Um, the biological opinion from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that this project would remove habitat for about 30 birds, 30 black rails, which doesn't sound like much, but consider that there are fewer than 3,000 left. 
and potentially as few as 1,000. So that is one to 3% of the Eastern Black Rail, Rail population um, removed from this single project, not to mention the changes to hydrology, to noise, to air pollution um, that, that will be adjacent to this facility in this premier Black Rail habitat. This has been going through FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission since 2017. Um, this company, Bench, uh, Commonwealth, has invested probably millions of dollars in prepping this site. Um, we have effortlessly tried to convince FERC and other agencies to get them to consider alternative locations. So far, that hasn't worked. Um, and so here are a few of the, um, the facts of what the Commonwealth means for, for birds, right? So I already mentioned the loss to black rail. Um, there's also Chenier habitat on this, on this property, uh, which is the first stopover habitat that trans gulf migratory songbirds would use after an 18 to 20 hour journey across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there is a, the, the, the only large colonial waterbird rookery is just upriver in, in Lake Calcasieu on Rabbit Island. The state just invested um, $20 million in restoring that island, uh, which supports thousands of nesting brown pelicans, reddish egrets, um, various terns, black skimmers, so on and so forth. And they commute up and down this pass uh, right adjacent to um, this facility right here to get to the Gulf. Um, and then this project would, would contribute 3.5 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every year, which would require something like 4 million acres of forest to offset, to sequester that carbon, 4 million acres. Remember what I also said about black rails, right? Climate change is probably the number one threat. So this project has all kinds of impacts. Um, to, to black rails and, and other, other bird species. What this means for people, people who live in the community who visit Cameron Parish, 152 tons of volatile organic compounds, including class one and class two carcinogens, would be released into the atmosphere every year. In conjunction with other adjacent, either proposed or existing LNG terminals, export terminals, uh, this would create a poor air quality hotspot in Cameron Parish at one of the most important and desirable bird watching locations in the state. Um, LDEQ, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, is not considering the cumulative impacts of multiple LNG plants in the, reason, in the region. They are evaluating each facility independently and so therefore underestimating the cumulative risk to birds and to the community, to wildlife. LNG means for the United States. And this is a really weird time to be talking about LNG exports, especially given what's going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, this has global implications. So let me point you first to this map. Sabine Pass here on the left exists. Calcasieu Pass right there in the center is nearing completion of construction. And then Cameron LNG up towards the top of the map exists. Um, CP2 is moving forward. Commonwealth LNG is the one I'm talking about. Delphin LNG is another one that's moving forward. There's a public um, comment period that's open right now for a, a piece of that project, uh, which that deadline will be March 29th. And then there are three, four, five other proposed LNGs in the region that are all moving through FERC right now. Um, so this would supply natural gas to foreign markets like China, India, Japan, and Europe, especially now that Russia, being one of the global exporters of natural gas, is being cut off from the world. Um, however, this export facility will drive up energy costs to U.S. consumers even more um, by undervaluing by overvaluing our own uh, LNG, which makes sense. You know, rich people who can make a buck are going to get richer off of this. Um, these jobs that they often tout for, um, for these facilities tend to benefit people who live in Texas. Um, 
it does not necessarily employ a lot of locals um, and much less even a lot of people from Louisiana. If you look at the Calcasieu Pass and the Sabine Pass and the Cameron LNG um, license plates of people who are coming and going, they're mostly Texas. Um, this is not a win for Louisiana, for Louisiana jobs. Um, we give huge tax breaks through Cameron Parish and through the state to attract these facilities. So we're not actually, the state isn't making much money on them. Um, so it's, it's a really scary and challenging set of circumstances, um, which becomes even more complicated, like I said, with the invasion uh, into Ukraine right now um, in, the, in the global geopolitical landscape. So this is a key week. So right now um, the air permit is being, is, is undergoing a public comment period. This is a unique opportunity for the community to get involved up front and, and speak their mind about the facility. Um, there is a public hearing being held at the Cameron Courthouse on Thursday in two days at 6 p.m. Um, it's not gonna be, you know, there's no virtual option. You have to go in person, unfortunately. So we're trying to recruit people to actually show up and offer a you know, one minute, two minute, three minute testimonial about why they think this air, this air permit should not be approved. Um, but there's also a, a written comment period with a deadline of March 21st, so a week from yesterday at 4.30. And those public comments can be emailed to deq.publicnotices at la.gov. Um, and then tomorrow, Audubon Delta is sending out an action alert through its email list. Uh, which I will try to post everywhere and anywhere on social media so that as many people see it as possible, which will have a form letter and some more information about um, talking points that people can use to, to try to push back on this air permit. Of course, the next steps on this, there is still an environmental impact statement that the company has been required to work through. Um, so that is in progress. Uh, there will be another comment period on that. Um, I believe the wetland permits have already kind of gone through. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of different pieces that have to come together for these facilities to go forward, not to mention, you know, the global markets to make sure that it's still profitable at the end of, of the planning. So this is one step, but it's an important one to, to be involved. So that's where I'm ending it. This is the potential future fate of black rails in the state of Louisiana. And we all can play a role in, in helping ensure their survival. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Thank you to the tons of people that make this project actually happen. This is not easy. There's a reason why Black Rails have gone understudied and, and um, overlooked. Uh, it, is, it is really hard. We have had over 200 volunteers um, tromp through the marsh with us. Uh, they have lost cameras, they have lost hats, they have lost phones, they have, you know, this marsh is not forgiving. This is, this is incredibly hard work and so many volunteers have just stepped up and, and helped. And of course, all the, all the landowners that have um, given us permission and worked with us too. So here's my contact info. Um, you can tweet me at Audubon Eric. Um, you can email me. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, all that stuff. So um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. So, uh, Eric, what about uh, Southeast Louisiana for Black Rail? What do you think? Yeah, it's tough. So, High Marsh seems to do well um, where you have a stable platform. Um, you need that sediment, particularly uh, mineral sediments, to accumulate through wave and wind action and whatnot. So, the Chenier Plain is sort of that optimal uh, location. The Delta plane is very different. It subsides quickly. Even where you do have like chenier type habitat, it just transitions immediately into low wet marsh. Um, so there aren't, you know, I haven't been able to find any really good transition zones. Um, that said, there are anecdotal reports all over the place in Southeast Louisiana. Um, and so there could be little pockets of them out there. Um, our team members in, in Mississippi and Alabama also aren't having a whole lot of success in finding black rails in those systems either, probably for the same reason. But I, I sort of alluded to the fact that those, um, um, 
the passes of like the Mermintaw Pass, the Calcasieu Pass, Sabine Pass, Freshwater Bayou Pass. I think what those do, I'm actually going to show another slide here because um, what those actually do, so this is a little bit of, it takes a second to kind of get your eyes centered on this. So anything that's sort of like blue and green is shoreline that's relatively stable. Anything that's red has a really rapidly retreating shoreline. And so those passes create a very, a relatively stable shoreline. And um, I think it's the interaction of the freshwater, you know, coming in and interacting with, with wave and wind action. And it creates this sort of accumulation of sediment, which then over decades, centuries, stacks up and actually elevates the marsh a little bit with, with uh, mineral sediments. And so those seem to be like the really key places that, that black braille habitat um, exists in. And if you look in southeastern Louisiana, there's actually a nice green spit right there on, on Grand Isle. And we've looked, we've, you know, done surveys on Grand Isle and, um, you know, it's a small island, but we can't, we haven't found them there. I know there's some anecdotal records from, from Grand Isle too that are probably legit, but if those are birds just passing through, it's probably more likely than a breeding population. But yeah, maybe some of the backsides of these barrier islands, you know, where you have those marsh platforms, there may be some little pockets of black rail habitat out there, but I suspect most of the delta delta plain isn't does just doesn't have the suitable stuff. If you find good expanses though of Spartina spartani, um, that'd be a good place to look. Berichia frutescens, which is the sea oxide, that's another really good one. That's another high marsh plant. About a about 30 years ago, when I was in grad school, we ran into a we stumbled on a population. I don't know, 10 birds nesting in North Georgia in the Piedmont in a little grassy marsh on a, um, a river floodplain, a small river floodplain. Do you think there's anything like that could exist in Louisiana further inland? I, I know that was kind of unique. I, I had nobody had ever really heard of that before at the time, but. Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a pretty widespread interior population across the United States 100, 150 years ago. And that's pretty much evaporated. Um, there are still little pockets in, in you know, Colorado, Utah, um, and maybe elsewhere, you know, like in the Atlantic coast. And, but it's very, very, yeah. I don't have a good sense of what that would even look like if I stumbled across it. Um, but it would, I would be surprised if there's places like that in, in Louisiana. I think most of that habitat would have been further north, further inland, um, up, up, you know, with more elevation. But yeah, who knows? Isn't that the, I mean, that's part of the fun of the black rail is, like, could it exist there? It's, it's like, it's like one step removed from being an ivory wood, ivory bill woodpecker. <laughs> could and it be I there? 